the chamber is inclined to um, continue until 2.30. Uh, that's a little bit longer than usual. That's due to the circumstance and also in order to avoid that the defense um, misses a major part of the submissions when expected to um, make further submissions tomorrow. To the extent the prosecution could finish by then, that would be appreciated. If not, limited time will be available tomorrow morning. Um, and I do understand from Madame Registra that this would be possible in view of all those assisting us. If that is, when I'm mistaken, I'd like to be informed. You may proceed, Ms. Bibles. Thank you, Your Honor. While these direct manifestations of intent alone would be sufficient to find the requisite intent, considerably more evidence is found in Rodko Mladic's conduct. My colleagues have set out in compelling detail for you exactly how forces under Mladic and Karadic's control turned their genocidal intent into reality and made those targeted populations vanish. The record also reflects the shared genocidal intent of other members of the JCE, in particular the man who selected Mladic to command the military forces, Radovan Karadic. Karadic expressed his genocidal intent towards Bosnian Muslims as early as October 1991, when he warned Bosnian Muslims that Bosnian independence would entail, quote, the same highway of hell and suffering, unquote, that Slovenia and Croatia went through. He also indicated that this would result in a, quote, possible extinction, unquote, of the Muslim people. You'll find this at P2004 at the bottom of page three in English, or the transcript reference 15521 lines 16 to 21. As the attacks were well underway in the municipalities, Radovan Karadic gave the 17th Assembly session, which started on the 24th of July, 1992, an accurate status of the Bosnian Muslim populations. Quote, they think they are being nationally established, but in fact, they are vanishing, unquote from P4581, page 86 in the English translation. Karadic also acknowledges, acknowledged to his followers and subordinates that the groups were being physically destroyed and agreed with the assertion that the conflict had been, quote, roused in order to eliminate the Muslims, unquote. That's exhibit 4581, again at page 86. Beyond the direct evidence of intent, additional evidence considered in totality supports the conclusion that Rodko Mladic and other JCE members had genocidal intent. Genocidal intent can be readily inferred from the scale and repetitiveness of the genocide and other culpable acts in the municipalities, the level of brutality, methods employed, an animus exhibited during the commission of those acts, and the fact that they were all directed against all members of the groups. Genocidal and other culpable acts were directed against and impacted virtually all members of the groups in the municipalities. Your Honors, the first witness in this trial spoke to you as a man, but he portrayed vividly the 13-year-old boy who experienced persecution at its worst. In boyish terms, he described an idyllic rural childhood in a multi-ethnic area in which children played without regard to religion or ethnicity. He and his family were forced from their home. Elvedin described a boy's excitement several days later about returning home and then the heartbreak of finding his home damaged the mosque destroyed, the elder left behind murdered, and his dog, who he was anxious to reunite with, shot dead. 
Alvadim Pasic and his family fled from village to village and finally into an enclave from which he and mostly men tried to flee in a column. Surrendering for this group that he was with was not enough. Alvadin lay in the mud and heard his father and other men beaten and abused. Miss Pebbles, you are developing a speed of speech which causes problems for the transcripts. Slow down, not too much, but okay. sufficient. Elvedine's very core seemed shaken when he described hearing a man he held in great regards, the Hajja, being beaten to death. Although Elvedine escaped this fate, over 150 men who surrendered were executed. May I <coughs> interrupt you and ask, is uh, this a protected witness? No. Thank you. Elvedine's painful words describe the pattern that had been repeated before and would be repeated over and over again. From the hand waving in the window in 1992 that haunts Elvedine Pasich to the ghost that haunted Mursada Malagic from 1995 until her murdered family members were finally found more than a decade later in Srebrenica. These genocides are connected by the stated intent of Ratko Mladic and the other members of the JCE who were determined to destroy not just a way of life for Bosnian Muslim and Croat communities, but the communities themselves. Your Honors, the prosecution has proven counts one and two genocide. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bibles. Mr. Groom, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. General Milotic exercised highly effective, effective command and control over the VRS. To return to the concept that General Danitz spoke to you about, he exercised fingertip control. That is, the control a commander achieves when he has developed an instinctive sense of how things are, how things should be, and how he wants things to develop, enabling him to direct the actions of his subordinates with great precision. The term fingertip, fingertip control is a term used precisely for the image that it brings to mind, possibly the operator of a complex machine controlling it from his or her keyboard. The ability to control a large organization as if it were simply an extension of one's own hands. This level of control meant that the VRS troops were engaged in operations. If they were engaged in operations, it was because Milotic intended those operations. This is what enabled him to deploy the VRS and subordinated units in the commission of crimes. This was his greatest contribution to the JCEs that have been described here today. Relevant to an assessment of General Milotic's submissions in this hearing is the recent appeals judgment in the Georgievich case. At paragraph 169 at Sequay, the appeals chamber discusses the role a hierarchical structure can play in a joint criminal enterprise. The evidence shows that the VRS under General Milotic's tenure was an especially effective hierarchical structure. Milotic had experience in bringing together poorly organized and fragmented formations and forging them into a cohesive unit moving in the same direction. At the 16th assembly session, he described his incorporation of Milan, Milan Martic's men into a single fighting force during the ethnic cleansing campaign in Croatia. 
General Mladic knew before even being formally appointed that key to his success was melding the disparate fighting formations in Bosnia into a single effective fighting force under a single line of authority. As he said to the 16th Assembly, quote, I do know how to command an army. We cannot have 100 masters in one home. The army must have a unified command, unquote. Once appointed, he quickly realized this important principle. Thus, fully prepared for the situation in Bosnia, General Mladic hit the ground running. From the day he was appointed commander, he was able to exercise command and control over the VRS. He was able to do this because he inherited the functioning infrastructure of the JNA. As you heard General Milovanovic explain to you, he inherited, the VRS inherited the core commands, the logistic basics, the bases, a common doctrine, all that existed prior. So by linking to the existing, existing communication networks and other infrastructure, the VRS came to life within 24 hours. And from one moment to the next, combat reports came in regularly. Part of this infrastructure was, of course, General Mladic himself. He had been appointed the commander of the second military district on the 9th of May, and in that capacity, had already begun the issuance of orders. For example, P3032 or P2866. Part of this infrastructure was, of course, the other members of the main staff, a newly constituted group of old comrades who had worked together in the same military their entire careers. This familiarity of personnel and infrastructure was instrumental in Milotic's ability to quickly assert his own will over this organization in furtherance of Karadic's instructions to him. So from the beginning of the indictment period, the VRS was capable of reliably and predictably carrying out General Milotic's orders. P3057 is an example of this. I want to spend a few minutes setting out how Mladic used specific command principles to create and maintain his fingertip control. I will deal with one, the principle of a single command, two, the principle of subordination, and three, the principle of inspection. The first is the principle of singleness of command. There is only one line of command authority. A line that begins with Karadic, flows directly through Mladic to his immediate subordinates, to their immediate subordinates, and so on, so that the orders given to every single soldier travels along a carefully constructed network. He integrated and brought the territorial defense units within this structure. Recall the evidence that Raiko Kusic, whom Mr. Traldi referred to, he was the commander of the Rogatica territorial defense on the 12th of May. But by the 25th of May, he was leading the cleansing of Rogatica town as the commander of the Rogatica brigade of the VRS. The second command principle I will address is the principle of subordination. In short, superiors issue orders to subordinates who carry out those orders. This principle ensures that the will of the Supreme Commander Karadic was communicated to Mladic, his direct subordinate, who in turn then initiated the orders necessary to his subordinates. The essence of the order always remaining constant, 
only the details being tailored to the specific area of responsibility of the particular subordinate unit. A cascade of commander's intent flowing downward to subordinates whose only obligation was to obey. Discussing in order, a senior VRS officer who testified here at transcript 5027 said that a subordinate in the VRS had no discretion whether or not to obey an order. No discretion. This directly reflected General Dannett's assessment that the VRS was a centrally controlled army in which subordinate commanders had little latitude when interpreting orders. They simply strictly adhered to the dictates of the order. Also constituent to the principle of subordination is the requirement for subordinates to report to superiors the results of their implementation of an order. Reporting on the implementation of an order, together with other relevant information, was an inherent component of subordination. Reports flowed back up the chain of command from the foot soldier up to the commander of the main staff, who, him, who himself was responsible for reporting to Karadzic. General Milo Milovanovic testified, subordinate commanders had no discretion not to, to submit a report, even when there was nothing new to report. The procedure for the daily combat reports ran like an expensive watch. As General Obradovich explained, the process began every day with battalions reporting to their brigade commanders who reported to their corps commanders who in turn reported to the main staff. These timely informative reports enabled Mladic to make informed and timely decisions and issue new or follow-up orders down the chain of command. This cyclical loop of orders flowing continuously, ensuring that subordinates were never without the direction of the commander, and he was never without the information necessary to direct them. As General Danet and General Milovanovic both made clear, this cycle was at the heart of how General Mladic maintained fingertip control. Mladic was able to issue directives and orders confident that they would be implemented as he intended and assured that he would receive reports confirming this. General Mladic's commanders and staff knew also that they could not exceed his orders. This principle was illustrated early in the war on 24 May 1992, during the barracks crisis in Sarajevo, when then Colonel Tolomir caught the brunt of Mladic's fury after informing Mladic that he had agreed that the VRS would leave behind some ammunition. And that's an, inter that's an intercept, that's P2752. The very next day on the 25th, in another transcript, P2755, Momchillo Mandic tells Tolomir that no one can pass to the barracks without General Mladic's authorization. This time, Tolomir simply says, quote, well, that's clear, unquote. General Obradovich gave evidence that assistant commanders on the main staff, quote, can only issue orders in the spirit of the basic decision adopted by the commanders, unquote. In the absence of General Mladic, he explained, an assistant commander's order can only go as far as the framework laid down by the commander while he was there. General Obradovic put it in very simple terms. He had never heard of any main staff assistant commander ignoring or failing to follow any of General Mladic's orders. The last command principle which ensured General Mladic's fingertip control 
was the principle of inspection. This principle was in addition to the reports that Mladic received. This principle ensured the verification of the information Mladic was receiving through the VRS reporting mechanisms. This principle required superiors to proactively monitor their subordinates to ensure that the commander, commander of the main staff's will was being faithfully fulfilled on the ground. Mladic not only expected his subordinate commanders to monitor and inspect their subordinates, but he himself was constantly out in the field for this purpose. There was evidence of this throughout the war. From the start of the war in Sarajevo to the, the operation in Srebrenica. He was at forward command posts, checking that his orders were being followed. He was at brigade headquarters. He was at specific artillery emplacements. When he deemed necessary, he micromanaged commanders, ordered the movements of individual soldiers and pieces of equipment. Danid pointed to Mladic's engagement at the, quote, main point of effort, unquote, engaging in the most critical areas at the right time. Even when he couldn't get to the field, General Mladic used every means at his disposal to ensure that subordinates were carrying out his orders and that he had the information necessary to take next steps. As General Dannett made clear, physical location was unimportant in the exercise of command as long as there was effective communication. Your Honors, you will recall General Milovanovich's evidence that the VRS communication networks functioned throughout the war with only a single lapse of two hours. General Mladic made frequent phone calls to his subordinate units. The commander of the East Bosnia Corps expected the daily call from General Mladic or the main staff to discuss their regular report that day. Your honors will recall the Srebrenica trial video, P1147, showing General Mladic calling from Belgrade, among other things, to inquire about events up at Vinko's, which as you saw was a reference to the Zvornik Brigade. Apart from these three command principles, General Mladic dealt fully in every aspect of command to enhance the operational capacity of his troops. He dove into the details of staffing, logistics, communications, and other aspects of command not immediately visible on the field, but essential to understanding the combat readiness of his troops and to further the objectives of the JCE. Mr. Traldi has already addressed the chamber on Mladic's hand selection of his subordinate officers. He made sure, in short, that he had the people he could rely on to implement his orders. You've seen the evidence of the crimes General Mladic's army has been, had been engaged in throughout the indictment period across Bosnia. Forcible transfers of non-Serbs, murders of non-Serbs, the mass detention of non-Serbs, the vast logistics of expelling citizens, of disposing of bodies. The VRS was engaged in all these operations. The principles of command and control, the simple written text on paper is but theory. But you have heard the evidence of a number of VRS officers at different levels of the army that Mladic and his use of the principles of command and control were a powerful force compelling VRS personnel in everything that they did. You've seen the extensive evidence of Mladic's ability to direct this large, complex organization with precision. You have seen evidence of his fingertip control. General Danitz said, quote, command and responsibility cannot be separated. Unquote. General Mladic exercised command and is responsible for the conduct of those he gave orders to. 
Your Honors, for the last several hours, we have addressed the arguments presented by General Mladic's defense in their 98 bis submission. We have marshaled just a small portion of the evidence which supports each and every count of the indictment. During the prosecution case, we have adduced sufficient proof of each crime set out in the 11 counts of the indictment, proof that is both credible and reliable, proof that establishes both the actus reus and mens rea of each of the crimes. One important category of evidence which merits special mention before I conclude our submissions today is that group of exhibits which originate from General Mladic himself. The chamber now has before it a nearly complete collection of his military notebooks from the period of the indictment as well as video and audio recordings which memorialize conversations he had with others about events in the conflict. This body of evidence was recovered by police officers from Serbia on two occasions in 2008 and 2010. Slide I-1 enumerates all of the admitted exhibits which came from the Mladic home. This is important evidence from General Mladic's own hand and possessions. It is important in its own right, but also because it corroborates much of the other evidence the Chamber now has before it. Considering the prosecution's evidence in light of what was recovered from General Mladic's home will also help the Chamber understand the full import of this evidence. For example, P1959 is an audio cassette tape recovered from the Mladic home. The label on the tape bears the caption, quote, 7 October 1991, operations around Scraton, Shibe, and Zadar, unquote. An excerpt of what Mladic says is now on the screen on slide I2. This tape records his contemporaneous comments at a time when he was involved in the events in Croatia before any of the charged crimes in the indictment. It's an excerpt of a conversation he had with a subordinate, Lieutenant Colonel Milosov, during operations in the Zadar area. He makes no known, in no uncertain terms, his disposition towards civilians. Quote, all that is older than 10 and younger than 75 will come to harm in Shibenik if they carry on like this. Mr. Groom, sorry to interrupt you. The, the I-1, uh, I don't know whether there's anything missing or whether it's just a double that P-4518 was, I think, twice on the 0, 4518. Do I see that it's there twice? That's, that's possible, Your Honor. Yes, documents, first line, last two items is a double. Now, I see that, yes. If, if it's just a double, then we are not missing anything. If, however, 14518 stands for another number, then we might miss something. Could you please verify that? I will check that, Your Honor. Yes. So. We could go to slide, the, the next slide, I3. Slide I3 shows an excerpt from another tape recovered from the Mladic home. This particular one is a dictaphone tape. Please, no, no, no loud speaking, no conversations, otherwise, Mr. Janovic, you know the rules. You know, please take care that your client is abiding to them as well. Please proceed, Mr. Groom. Here in P1969, Mladic has recorded a conversation he had with a person by the name of Marinko in 1993. No speaking aloud. I say it now for the second time, and otherwise, Mr. Mladic, you'll be aware of the consequences. Please proceed, Mr. Groom. So he's speaking to a person by the name of Marinko in 1993, where in reference to Muslims and Croats, he says, quote, May they disappear, both them and the other ones. Unquote. 
Evidence such as this will assist the Chamber in assessing Milotic's state of mind during the crimes charged in the indictment. The words of Milotic were not only recorded by himself, but also by confidants such as Milan Lesic, a supporter and benefactor of the VRS living in Canada. P1974 is an excerpt from a videotape made by Lesic during one of his meetings with Milotic. The video was made with Milotic's knowledge. An excerpt is here on slide I-4. Here, referring to the Muslim population of Srebrenica, he says that but for the international community, the Muslim population of Srebrenica would have disappeared long ago. The evidence the chamber now has before it is as compelling as it is comprehensive. It is evidence that demonstrates that the army of Republika Srpska had an effective system of command and control throughout the time that the crimes were being committed. It is evidence that proves that Ratko Mladic, as commander of this army, used his ability to command and control those under his authority to commit the crimes enumerated in counts 1 to 11. I want to return to two documents recovered from the Mladic home for the last two documents I will discuss. They both contain the words of General Mladic after the Dayton Peace Accords had been signed, after the indictment period. The first is a speech he made on the 14th of January, 1996, to a gathering to celebrate the Serbian New Year. It has been admitted as P1981 and was recovered from the Mladic home in 2010. In his comments, he makes clear that the most significant military decisions were taken within a close circle of members of the main staff, while the most difficult ones were, quote, quite often taken by no one else but myself, unquote. The last document I will ask you to consider today is the last document General Mladic signed as the commander of the main staff. On the day the authority he had previously enjoyed was no longer vested in him. It was transferred to General Milovanovic. The last day any of us spends in a position or job is most often a time of retrospection and reflection. We don't have the English version. I'll show that in one second, Your Honor. I okay. want to make point out a few things about this before. That'll be the next slide. It is with this that I would ask you to look at P5028. On the slide before you is an image of the document. As you can see, it bears General Milotic's signature and stamp of the main staff. The last document General Milotic signed. Apart from transferring his responsibility as commander of the main staff to Milovanovic, he makes a number of requests to the president of Republika Srpska. At this time, it was Bielana Plavsic, Karadic having resigned the previous July. These requests concern the welfare of his soldiers and their families. He says with the transfer of authority, quote, as a simple man with a heavy task and in unusual times, I am worried about the fate of the army and the people who created the army, unquote. I want to now draw your attention to paragraph three, where he makes a request that is particularly prescient. Quote, that the president of the RS will give written guarantees that not one member of the army of the RS will bear any disciplinary, criminal, or other responsibility or consequences for the execution of orders in line with the decisions and orders of General Mladic up to the passing of this decision." Unquote. Mr. Ivatich began his submissions to you asserting, quote, General Mladic never intended nor ordered any crimes, 
unquote. A general who has never given an illegal order does not seek immunity for those who followed his orders. General Mladic requested this extraordinary grant of immunity for his subordinates because he knew he had taken decisions and had given orders to his subordinates to commit crimes. The crimes that are enumerated in the indictment and now fully established with the evidence you have before you. The next time I address the chamber on the merits of this evidence, I will be submitting that it establishes the guilt of Mladic beyond reasonable doubt. Today, I simply submit that this evidence meets the applicable standard articulated by the appeals chamber. There is sufficient evidence upon which a reasonable trier of fact could be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt of the guilt of Ratko Mladic for each of the crimes set out in each of the counts in the indictment. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Groom. This would then conclude the submissions for today. Uh, tomorrow, Mr. Ivitic, you have we have reserved one hour for you. We also have reserved one hour for the defense uh, for the for the prosecution uh, to respond. Um, therefore, we adjourn for the day and we'll resume tomorrow. Wednesday, the 19th of March at 9.30 in the morning in this same courtroom one. All rise.